Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, welcome to Uncommon Sense. I'm Junia Doan. Thank you for joining us. My guest today is Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and best-selling author, Lucinda Franks. Lucinda, a former staff writer for the New York Times, has written both novels and memoirs. She is the author of Timeless Love, Morgenthau and Me. Welcome, Lucinda. You have two lives, partly in the city and partly in the country. That's right. And the country, it's full of apple trees and orchards of other kinds. Yeah, peach trees, plum trees. Uh, we have organic vegetables. Uh, and, uh, you know, you and I are at the mercy of our news bosses. But farmers are at the mercy of God. And we found this, we find this out a lot. But we found it out this winter. Uh, well, no, I'm sorry. It was winter weather in April. Yeah. And uh, we had a freeze. And the buds were just coming out uh, from the fruit trees. And uh, the temperature dropped below 18 degrees. And oh. they cannot tolerate that. So in spite of having oil cans situated through the... Uh, orchards filled with diesel and apple wood that we set a fire yeah. and we had a helicopter going around trying to push the warm air down to save the apples. We probably saved half the crop but we lost half of everything we had and we lost the peaches and the cherries completely. That's sad because it takes yes. a long time yes. to grow a, a mature tree that produces fruit. Mm -hmm. That's right. How long does it take, would you say? I know it's uh, variable. From planting a small sapling, uh, I would say about three years. And then you would have a few blossoms and a few apples. And then the next year it would, you know, burst forth. Did you find a pattern as to where the trees did die? Did it have to do with elevation? Uh, yes, or wind that's or? a very good point. Uh, the lower they were, the more chance they had of surviving. We had peach trees on the knoll, which is probably the highest part of the orchards, and they were gone the first night. We had two nights of freezes. They were gone the first night. Uh, the cherries were high, and they were gone. The, the ones that were protected were much better off. A life lesson. Yes, yes, and we have organic sprays that we use and uh, so people come to get the organic apples yes. and those were wiped out because oh. those were high up. Not good at all. No. You mentioned God and in, in so many um, other societies that are agrarian they have gods they worship because of weather issues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. We were praying a lot <laughs> before those uh, 22 degrees, uh, you know, began to drop in the in the night. So you're a city girl. Did farm life change you? Uh, well, we do the farms in the weekend. Yes. So both my husband and I work during the week, uh, and uh, we go. And we are different people. In the weekend, we don't have any, any friends purposely. We just like to relax and, you know, tend to the orchards and enjoy each other, which we are ships passing in the night, as yeah. you well know when you're a professional. Yes, fast and furious yes. in a certain sense. Exactly. Well, um, you have been a writer for most of your life. What drew you to writing early on? You know, I wanted to be an actress, and I played a Trojan woman. And afterwards, my drama teacher said, you overacted, you wailed, and you, you know, just blew it. 
go find something else. So I wanted to be a singer and I sung folk songs and I had a very nice voice, but my mother said, you don't have as good a voice as it takes to be an opera singer. So then I said, well, what is left in the arts? And I had begun diaries and writing poems when I was 11. So I turned to that because it was the only thing I could do. And to this day, it's the only thing I feel I can do. Do you find yourself in writing or do you start knowing what you're going to write before you write it? Uh, I have to feel uh, a person or a subject. I have to feel it in my bones to write about it. I can't just be given an assignment and write a book about it. And um, I've written two memoirs uh, in addition to other books. And the last one was about my father, who was a spy during World War II. And I didn't know about it until the end of his life when I found a Nazi uniform in his belongings and confronted him and got the secrets out of him. That's called My Father's Secret War. But I really felt my father as a character, not just as a father. And then my last memoir, Timeless, is about my husband and I, and I felt him after 35 years of marriage. I felt him as a character. I saw all his quirks, his, um, his, the beauty of his ethics and his personality. I, I just had that distance. So I really wanted to write about him. How would you give yourself that sense of a person if you hadn't lived with them for a really long time, like your father and your husband? Well, I think that you need to, when you're writing nonfiction and a memoir, for instance, you need to know the people. You need to know inside the people. And if you don't know the people, you have to know people that are like that person and uh, sort of imagine what is in their hearts and souls the same way as you know the people that they resemble. I read your book Beyond Moving, Beyond Instructive, Beyond Generous and Infallibly Honest. And I thought, he really loves her. <laughs> Well, Let me just go was into, was an experience. <laughs> into, into print. It, it was, it, I didn't, you know, I didn't stop at anything. I wanted to just, I didn't want to write a puff piece about my husband who's been district attorney of New York for 30 years and has quite a reputation as an international crime terrorist buster. Uh, I wanted to write an authentic portrait of him. So um, I, I wrote everything all his, his quirks and his um, downfalls and his faults and my faults. And so it was pretty honest. Um, I made him read every single draft of the book because I really was devoted to this book, but I was devoted to keeping my marriage intact right. <laughs> even more. Yeah. So he, he read it and He's, he's very laissez-faire. He said, you, you gotta write what you want. And if he went through something and I saw, a, you know, just a hint. Shadow over his face. Yeah, a shadow, face. exactly, a shadow <laughs> over his face. And I said, do you not like that? He said, it's your memory. And I knew I was in trouble. Yes. So I then would have to say, what don't you like about it? And he would read it and I'd look for the twitch of the facial muscle, you know, because he's very op opaque. He's not uh, uh, a transparent person. Uh, he, um, he would say, well, you know, I don't think this happened that way. And then I would take out my journals, which I kept all through our marriage, and we would find the incident and we would see who was right. And <laughs> most of the time I was because I'd written in it In spite down. of his infallible memory. Yes, exactly, and he has an infallible memory. But people don't remember things the way they happen. They remember things the way they've gathered up other people's memories and yes. put them together with uh, their own. When you were writing your journals, what did you, how did you approach that? Was it daily events, your thoughts on daily events? 
Yes, I, I wouldn't write every single day, but if he had a big case, if we had a wonderful moment, uh, if I saw something funny that he did or, you know, on the fence that he did, um, I would write it down. Uh, I wrote down a lot of things I saw people doing that were interesting. And, uh, but particularly, I would write down our fights. I would write down everything that was between us because I wanted a record of what it was like to be married to this incredible man. Uh, you're a plucky person <laughs> and uh, you're a seeker. You mm -hmm. want clarity. You want, mm -hmm. in my opinion, you want connection. And he is not so verbal. <laughs> no, no, not at all. And I think you gave him a gift that yes. he could not give himself. Yes. Or the dynamic between you. Uh huh. Your um, pulsating desire for connection with him mm -hmm. and understanding and your willingness to explore it all <laughs> it's sometimes hard on people who aren't like that right uh, but they're drawn to it like a warm fire mm -hmm. you know, absolutely. close but not too close absolutely you you make a beautiful point i hadn't even thought of that of, of it being a gift to him to <laughs> strip off his uh his veneer and show the real person or try to show the real person inside uh, and um, it's the only way I can write. Otherwise, it's boring. Yes. I, I don't know about you. I suspect you're the same way. If you go to a cocktail party, you can't make small talk. Can That's you? correct. You have to get right into it. Yes. And um, it's the same way with writing. Uh, you you have to get into it, and you can't just you know glide over the surface. Small talk makes me lonely. Mm. Oh, yes. Beautiful. Uh, and, yeah. And so I try to not have to do that <laughs> in great it chunks. It does. It's very lonely, isn't it? <laughs> it's just where do you live? What do you do? And you just feel a million miles away yes. from the person you're talking to. Yes. I do anyway. Yes. Yes. yes, yes it's similar. But in, in the book, there is this Havez quote about loneliness. Mm -hmm. and that you um, shouldn't run from it. In essence, you should nourish it or at least be mm -hmm. with it. Yes. Um, how did you take that to heart, to be with it? To be with loneliness? Yes. Well, I'm, I've learned to be an extrovert as a reporter, but in reality, I'm pretty much of an introvert. I like to, in the morning, I like to just let my mind have my coffee and let my mind just wander. Um, I think if you have an imagination, it helps because you don't have to sit and, you know, pick over your problems. You can think about other things and particularly if you have an art, like you do, like I do, you, you think about that, that art and what you're going to create. And I think loneliness is very creative. Mm -hmm. uh, where you are with people, you, you can get material for creating, but you don't create. Right. Um, also, I, I find in, in the nexus of my life anyway, and I'm really saying this so I can ask you this, that there are points that turn or have the possibility of change. And I find that the most exciting and the most challenging and the most painful sometimes because the options are all there, visible mm -hmm. and invisible. Mm -hmm. And once you decide on a course of action, well, then it's in a sense easier, for me anyway, because then you just do it in mm -hmm. one form or another. Mm -hmm. But the gestation part, and I um, have over the years asked myself, couldn't we speed this up? <laughs> <laughs> or couldn't we do this? Do you right. have periods like that where it's a, tr I call them transition periods often. Hmm. They're between where you've put a lot of yourself into something mm -hmm. and then the, it's just a quieter time. And yes. then what's next? 
Yes. That you choose rather than yes, the you storm get that chooses you. Right, right. right. You're, well, you're in a, a mode of, of you can't sleep, you, you're writing all the time. I mean, this is when uh, you get out of the sputtering jalopy and finally, you know, speed along uh, yeah. and it sort of writes itself. You miss that. And that becomes your modus operandi. That becomes you. Uh, so when that's not there anymore, it feels very empty, very empty. And you realize how much you depend on companion, depend for companionship on your characters, you know, on the people you're interviewing, uh, on your art. Uh, yes, without, without doubt. And one of the things in my early life that I did was work. And then I had to realize, because people say, we love you, Junior, but we don't see you. You know, that mm -hmm. you often have to plan your, I have to plan my life to schedule in the kinds of things that I could get distracted from. Yes. Just like yes. you've scheduled in the weekends with Bob. Right. But I work in the weekends, too. Well, but not, yeah. you know, every but day, not that hour. Every day. Yes, yeah. and so that in theory, mm -hmm. and I'm sure he does some work also because you're, you're you're driven to do that. But yes. the walks and mm -hmm. and one yeah. thing. Yeah. Now you had stepchildren and then your own children. Yes. And you were different ages, not by much, but mm -hmm. when you had your own, what did you learn about parenting? I learned that first of all, a woman does all the work, yes. and the men get all the credit from the children. Yes. They always gravitate towards daddy because mother has made them do their homework and tried to organize their lives. Uh, so you have to live with the fact that you're not going to be the most favored nation in that family. <laughs> yeah. And uh, But then you learn a lot from a husband because I think women... Some women can, um, you know, get very emotional about things. They can get very scared about accidents or, you know, is, is he doing well in school? Is she making friends? And a husband, my husband anyways, is very placid. And he'll be fine. She'll be fine. Uh, my youngest daughter didn't know her colors when she was in nursery school and they were concerned about that. So Bob read her a book and said, isn't that an interesting red balloon? She said, that's not a red balloon, Daddy, it's a purple balloon. So he said, see? And he was right. He was right. She just didn't want to tell him. Didn't want to tell the teachers the right things think that his um, relaxation was in part due to you because you would do it all. <laughs> <laughs> and if you had been more like him, <laughs> right. would he have become more like you I think in that's the first right. example? I think that's right. I have learned that when I start talking, he, gets, he goes silent like with friends. And as soon as I start to shut up, which is very hard for me. Um, he will come forth and, you know, contribute to the conversation. The same thing with our children. He will become much more hands-on if I'm hands-off. Oh, very, very useful. One of the things I admired about you, which I learned from a book, is your ability to reach out to take to see the next step and either jokingly, oh, why don't we go to Vegas and get married? <laughs> or, you know, calling mm -hmm. him up or, or any of this thing that you pushed through, uh, not towards a bigger goal, but you pushed through what any resistance you had or fear uh -huh. to try it. Right, and, uh, right. And I got that came out of your early life. Mm -hmm. uh, that may or may not be true. That's interesting, yes. Um, because when you had to handle your father's activities, which were right. sometimes not so pleasant towards your mother, right? once you live through that, maybe fear is different. Yeah, I guess you get used to stepping in. And uh, 
I know that that Bob, for instance, loves Israel and has such admiration for Israel. And one of the things we share, though I'm a Christian and he's a Jew, is that we have an exquisite sensitivity to the Holocaust. And Israel was an extension of that for him. So, but, but he wouldn't go because he hated to fly. So one day I just went and got tickets and um, said, we're going um, <laughs> next Thursday. I cleared it with his secretary. So he yeah. didn't have any major things going on. And he, and he was shocked and he argued and, you know, stomped around. And finally he said, all right, we're going. <laughs> so I, I learned that, and I think a lot of women do this, um, is to just manage <laughs> your lives, um, to take things in your own hands. I always admired women because I think they create the nest and mm -hmm. they create, not every marriage, but they create the culture of the marriage. The culture of the marriage, that's a wonderful phrase. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you know, there's a lot of talk about feminism, and are you powerful, and this or that, but th they're missing the quiet of, <laughs> in my opinion anyway, right? Um, of how powerful they are in setting uh -huh. tone, direction, yes. action. Yes. Even. And, yes. Uh, th that is um, a credit to them that the man ha or the, the husband has faith in them mm -hmm. to trust, even right. though he's not necessarily drawn to take a 12 hour flight to Israel or right. whatever it is, <laughs> the men's flight is, yes. and yes. go through the frisking and, yeah. and whatever else. Yeah. That the wife's, in this case, your instincts are so good that they're worth trusting. Plus, mm -hmm. he loved you a great deal. You know, when you right. love, you do a lot of things you don't really want to do. <laughs> <laughs> right, no. you tolerate a lot of things. What have you tolerated? With Bob? Yes. Uh, his, um, his silence, his uh, reluctance to talk about uh, emotions, um, talk about feelings he has, he won't talk about them sometimes because I think he doesn't even know about them. That he has, um, he was a war hero. I think he's suffered like so many men in World War II who were never diagnosed with PTSD. I think he suffers from that. And in, in Timeless, um, I go into that uh, quite, because I discover that the reason he can't feel his own feelings is because he's, instead of becoming violent and um, uh, outwardly uh, uh, expressive destructive. and destructive like many PTSD veterans are, he, you know, closeted everything inside because he needed to do that in order to work, in order to achieve, in order to do the good he wanted to do in the world and not just become closed up inside himself. What a gift, What in a lot of levels. Um, the writing part, when you say you were obsessed, I, I understand obsession, but what was it like for you? It's just, I'm working on a novel now, and all weekend, we were eating in a restaurant, it was a beautiful restaurant, and you know, I was scribbling away in my notebook every three seconds, because the ideas kept coming, and thank God I have a incredibly tolerant husband who does love me a lot, and he just smiled, and he said, working on your book? <laughs> and I said, well, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I think you just, everything else, you know, fades away and you're just thinking of what you're going to create. Uh, and for, sometimes this has adverse effects. My last memoir, My Father's Secret War, I worked, you know, frantically on. I had a deadline, but I also was just caught up in it. I brought the typewriter, I mean the computer, to uh, dinner, to breakfast, everywhere. And my kids were used to seeing mommy, you know, banging away. And when I put the last period on the last sentence, I sighed, got up, and couldn't stand up straight. 
I was like this and had to have emergency back surgery, lower back surgery, because for sitting so long, right. um, I had uh, gotten a, a disc pinched. So, um, you know, I advise everybody who's obsessed, get up and walk around and be obsessed. Don't but just it also sit there. says something else, that you have the discipline or the focus to override pain in the pursuit of a goal that yeah. uh, I can't say was eluding you, but revealing itself over right. slower or faster or whatever, but needed to be revealed to the point where you were satisfied with it. Right. And that's a right. wonderful characteristic to have. Well, you don't have to get distracted. As a parent, did you find that your children were putting up with you with your writing or felt neglected or um, you did it when they weren't around? When they were little, I really didn't write much. Um, I concentrated on them, but I was working for the New York Times then, so I had to go into work right. every day. And when I came home, I didn't do any more writing. I, I devoted the time to them, but when they got to be, you know, teenagers, preteens, I figured then they were on their way and I could, um, you know, take up what I really wanted to do. How are you a different person now? at this stage of life than you were in decades past? Oh, I'm much calmer. <laughs> Bob has taught me to be much calmer. I find that my own sorus and angst that we all have doesn't override the creativity in my imagination that I need to create something. So I feel like I'm much more creative now. I'm moving at a faster pace whereas I had writer's block a lot during you know, my early years. Thank you so much, Lucinda. Well, we certainly learned a lot here. Uh, the very first thing is that she learns through her senses. And so to write well, or at least from her point of view, is to know the person or someone like him to get the reality through. Bygone times of her youth gave her a certain sense of confidence to blast through or keep after things. Um, plus, she's gifted with a high level of curiosity and willingness to, to follow that through till she can get sort of spiritual resolution as well as emotional resolution. She married a wonderful man, bravo to him for her and her to him. No easy thing to make a good marriage over years and tremendous change and everything we bring to it. And she was wise enough, wise enough to read his face. So as you go through your life, please remember <laughs> there are more than words in life. There's energy, there's perception, there's understanding. She took, um, um, what do I want to say, the creative process further as the joyride into herself to make a life well understood. Do that for yourself. Please do something kind for someone you know and someone you don't know. And I'll see you the very next time. Have a good week. To contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadone.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadone.com. Thanks for joining us. See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junia Doan. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you.